thanks everyone for coming to the Tempe Lab Forum. Uh, this week we have a presentation by Jordan Lacey, who is currently at the uh, School of Design at RMIT, and um, previously uh, did a PhD in the spatial information architecture laboratory, if I'm not mistaken in right. Spot on. Uh, which I think now is the institute formerly known as the Spatial Information Architecture Laboratory. <laughs> Sounds just a symbol, it sounds. Um, so I first became aware of Jordan uh, through the Australian Forum for Assistive Ecology as a kind of a, a world player in the um, theory of earth soundscapes um, and also through uh, the field of sound studies, which is a field that's simultaneously been quite active for 30 years and has emerged in the last two years. Possible. I, it's crazy, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting thing. There's, all, there's been this uh, kind of hive of activity around what gets the domain trained for the then acoustic ecology, soundscape studies, and then in sort of 2012, it seemed to me that um, some theorists more from um, digital humanities and so on um, started theorizing about sound under the rubric of sound studies. In any case, um, we've kind of moved uh, back even further to John Cage and his thinking about what silence and sound really mean. Um, and so Jordan's work, uh, as I became aware of it, was really intertwined in the rethinking of um, the concept of noise in urban environments. And uh, the, the salient fact that when sound is talked about in planning, some extent in architecture, but certainly in urban planning, it's almost always talked about as noise, as a bad thing, rather than potentially a, um, a good thing, which for any of us musicians and sound artists um, is a quite a striking problem. So uh, Jordan is now doing a postdoctoral fellowship at RMIT. Uh, he's a consummate sound artist, installation artist, Thanks very much, Toby. That was an amazing introduction. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you, John. Thank you, Lizzie, for the invitation to speak today. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, just to follow on from that, um, in terms of my relationship with acoustic ecology, I only first heard about acoustic ecology uh, before I started my PhD in a cross-university elective called Soundscape Studies at RMIT with Lawrence Harvey. And that's when I was introduced to that field and it struck me as exactly where I wanted to be because it brought together music, um, environmentalism and education. And I have a background in all of those three areas. So it uh, really struck my passion and I've run with it ever since. So uh, nice to be referred to as a real player in the <laughs> soundscape design. I'll, I'll take that on board. Um, so the particular bent taking with soundscape studies is to think about how we can apply sound art installations as a tool for urban soundscape design. So I certainly didn't start out thinking that way, it's become that way. My PhD saw me transition from a musician to a public sound art, a public sound installation artist and, uh, and the, uh, there was a lot of thinking that took place in that process wherein I uh, took the precepts of acoustic ecology and in, and in my own language uh, recalibrated them or, or updated them to allow me to talk about them in relation to my urban practice. Um, that hasn't necessarily been uh, taken as well as I would like by, by some, but in general that's what I felt was necessary and, and the book um, is, is, is very much about that. So the, the term sound installation is really invented by the, the musician come sound artist Max Neuhaus. Uh, who produced a, a series of wonderful sound installations. I'm, I'm sure you know of him and his work. And the soundscape design, well, as, as Toby said, um, uh, acoustic ecology weren't the first to bring our attention to environmental listening, but certainly this idea of soundscape design, acoustic design, or that designers could somehow change the sounds of the city was really put forward by R. R. Murray Schaefer with his field-defining book, The Soundscape, The Tuning of the World, in 1977. But there's been surprisingly little crossover in discussion of the two approaches. 
Uh, and I say surprising because it seems to me that uh, sound art installations are an obvious way for artists and designers to get practically engaged in this, in this issue of how our urban soundscape should be experienced. So, uh, I'm, I'm possibly a, a repetition, but my research is interested to discuss these two distinct practices in combination, particularly as a means for creative practitioners to be engaged in the act of producing our cities. So not just architects and planners and engineers and, and, and policy makers, but also artists and designers there at the beginning contributing to, to these discussions. So by integrating sound art installations, soundscape design becomes more than a tool for urban renewal, or that is uh, resolving noise issues, which is essentially is, is all it is at the moment. Uh, in practice, there's theorists who are, who are sending it in different directions, such as Lex Brown, um, Jian Kang, but, um, but essentially it's still about noise mitigation. So, uh, <coughs> and for me, I'm particularly interested in how sound art installations became, become a method for disseminating or activating the imaginative in an everyday context. So not just designing our cities for, for functional means, but also thinking about the imaginative needs of the population. So I'm going to start off with this. I actually wrote this after my book, but now I want to pretend I, I wrote it before my book, because <laughs> in some ways it's, uh, it, it starts off with this idea of placemaking. So placemaking is a, is a slightly contentious term because some would say, well, every, every, everything is a place anyway, but it's based on this idea of space being geometric or um, uh, you know, impersonal or uh, servicing certain functional needs of the town planner. And we turn space into place when people make a connection with space and it becomes part of their narrative or part of their story. So what part does the artist or the designer have to play in that role? So I, uh, I wrote an art, this article for Organised Sound based on an international field trip that was informed by the World Forum of Acoustic Ecology listserv where I, I said, hey, um, what, are, what are some great sound installations out there in, in urban spaces? And I, just, I wanted to go and visit them. So these are the 10 that I visited, hardly uh, comprehensive. There's a PhD by, oh, this is going out live, so uh, I'm going to mispronounce this person's name ter terribly, but uh, Gaskia Ozunian, my apologies, uh, <coughs> who wrote a, a wonderful PhD, really giving um, an incredibly diverse description of what a sound installation could be. I'm really narrowing it down and saying I'm interested in, in, in sound installations that are permanently installed in an, in, in an urban space. And all of these meet those requirements. So I could go through them all, but that would probably take up all my time. Uh, and, I, and I not only visited these installations and recorded them, I also interviewed their creators where possible. And as a result of that, I presented uh, some theory around, uh, around uh, what are the role of sound installations. So I started off with this, uh, the three approaches. Uh, the electroacoustic, so essentially uh, the placement of speakers in the environment. Uh, resonant, there's a lot of uh, sound installations that uh, use the resonant property of pipes or, or hollow tubes or whatever they might be. Um, and the third one is elemental, which for me is how uh, materials are placed in the environment that take advantage of the elements such as wind or water to generate sound. So just quickly some examples, actually no, I've got examples of all those. Carry on. And then I, uh, I came up with this tri-polar relationship between the environment, the social conditions and the artistic intention. And I built these 10 attributes of these installations based on my own uh, observations and recordings, but also my discussions with their creators. So I think what's interesting about this is we can say, if, if we take out uh, the artistic and just look at the bottom two sections here, we might think of the work like, of someone like Peter Cusack, who's very interested in, um, in how societies and individuals respond to the environment and, uh, and what sort of relationships they make with the environment. But there isn't the intent necessarily to artistically intervene in that relationship. Or if an artist only thinks about intervention and ignores the environment and ignores the social conditions, then this is simply an artistic work that isn't necessarily considering uh, the, the requirements of the soundscape. And this complex looking thing came at the end of the paper and essentially I'm, I'm saying that, uh, that at, at any, any installation site there's a pre-installation condition where a sound artist will 
use certain approaches, and then post installation you then have these works with these attributes, and then I've proposed that these attributes and approaches in combination become part of a larger toolkit for how we apply sonic placemaking. So that's, so that's essentially what that was in a nutshell. There's a lot more to say. So I'm, I'm just going to run through uh, the three types. There's now, there's now a fourth approach that is very clear to me that I think will, will be uh, clear to you as well. Uh, but the first one here, Elemental, this is a sound artist called Harry Batoya, who installed this in 1975 called Sounding Sculpture. Harry Batoya uh, worked with copper and brass and one day is carrying one of his sculptures along and he heard a ding, ding, ding. And from that point I believe he became obsessed with sound and, and had uh, warehouses full of these sort of objects that he recorded. And this one uh, takes advantage of the windy conditions of Chicago, thus it's uh, under Elemental. The second category is resonant. This is uh, Bruce Hodlin and Sam Olinga, uh, who created this wonderful work called Harmonic Bridge, which is in North Adams, Massachusetts. Uh, it was part of the Museum of Modern Art um, uh, exhibition at some point in the past, and it's now permanently located. Essentially, there's a 16-foot tuning tube above this bridge. It captures the uh, sounds and vibrations of passing traffic. And at specific intervals, there's a microphone that um, captures the key of C, which is a 16-foot tuning tube, and it plays it through these two speakers. So there's one on this side and one on the opposite side, giving this beautiful stereo um, uh, representation of what's going on above. So I'll just play that. I absolutely love this piece because it directly intervenes with one of the biggest soundscape issues that we have and that's traffic, which we're all afflicted by. And they really turn it into something genuinely peaceful. So you do get, um, you'll see that there's a patina on the top of that cube. That's because people literally sit there for long periods of time and the artists report people writing poetry and <laughs> dogs falling asleep by the, <laughs> by the speaker and all these sort of beautiful little anecdotes. Um, and now uh, the latest I heard is they're thinking of landscaping that space underneath the bridge in response to that soundscape. So this is a, in my mind, I think this is the first example of sound art installation that it can also um, be thought of as a, a great example of urban soundscape design. And I met the artists and had, had a fantastic conversation with them too. This is the famous Times Square, probably the first permanent sound installation, uh, put in, uh, 1977 and still there. Um, it's, it was taken out at, for a few years and now it's there permanently. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was interesting when I went to New York to, to listen to and record this, uh, you see it's fenced off because of the works, which you can see in the, in the bollard there. Uh, no, not the bollard, um, the display. <laughs> and uh, the hoarding is what I was meant to say. And um, anyway, the gallery that manages it said it was switched off and I was like, oh, you know, it's not working. And when I went down there, I clearly heard it. So they obviously thought um, visually because there was a fence around it, it wasn't working anymore. But of course, sound pays no attention to such barriers and, and, and it certainly spilled into the atmosphere. But also uh, friends I have who live there went down to visit it and they said, oh, we can't hear it, Jordan. But it's definitely there because it blends in so well with the environment. Um, but once you tune in, you hear these beautiful harmonic frequencies just sitting and within the, uh, the, the surrounding din. Hello? Oh, really? Hmm.
<laughs> we found it. <laughs> So keep in mind, I'm standing where that gentleman is in the blue baseball cap, not the red, but the blue, um, pointing a shotgun directly down into the, um, uh, the grating, because it sits underneath those sort of subway gratings and, and, and comes straight out. So that's why it sounds much louder than what it does when, you, when you're st standing where the gentleman the red hat is, uh, where it blends into the surroundings. Now the fourth uh, approach that I've now added um, since, it's <laughs> way down there in the corner, uh, that I've added since uh, writing that paper is, is obviously interactive and I mean I'm involved in interactive works and visited interactive works but during that trip I didn't uh, didn't come across one now that is that isn't to say that they weren't around then of course they were but the the use um, and the application of interactive art is now exploding and uh, councils are looking for it so this is in Barcelona it's called Brum Brum That's my beautiful singing voice. You can see what the lights are doing. Okay, so <laughs> I should have tried to be a bit more harmonic in that moment. Um, but uh, essentially these, um, these sounding tubes, which you typically see at children's parks and so forth, where they can communicate with each other. In this case, when you're calling into it, this field of lights shimmers and, and waves, and it's, it's, it's quite a beautiful piece. So, four types. Uh, elemental, resonant, electroacoustic and interactive. Broadly speaking we can say they're the four approaches to embedding permanent sound installation art, to make that clear, permanent sound installation art, which is the sort of the permanent fixture of infrastructure. There's plenty of other types of uh, installation art as well that are, that are ephemeral or performative or temporary and so forth. So this is... Uh, the, uh, I wouldn't want to say I'm plugging the book but uh, <laughs> you know I, ha I have to mention it. So, um, so I, I wrote this for Bloomsbury in, in 2016 and it's, it's broken down into four chapters. Essentially the third chapter uh, describes the, uh, the, the PhD, the practice-led journey of the PhD, where it started and where it ended. Chapter four proposes uh, the sonic rupture model and uh, this is why I said um, I now talk about sonic placemaking first because really sonic rupture should be seen as an advancement to the idea of sonic placemaking but I wrote sonic placemaking secondly because in actual fact a lot of the, the artists and uh, architects and creators I spoke to uh, talked about placemaking and finding a spirit of place so, so it's this interesting thing but I was coming through as a I guess a younger generation thinking about these issues and this is how I'd, I'd applied the idea so that's that's how that reverse happened uh, so the I, I've got a whole bunch of theory to hit you up with here. I'm, I'm not sure if that's what you, you, you want right now. So um, I, I will try and um, rush through it to get to the more interesting sounds and images and so forth. But I, I do have time, I believe. So I did, just very quickly, the idea of a sonic rupture is built from Felix Guattari's A signifying rupture. This, he discusses this in the three ecologies. So I ask myself, what is a signifier in relation to sound. I spent a lot of time listening to urban sounds and they essentially are made up of air conditioners, climate controllers, transportation and sirens signifying uh, the risk of sounding. Too radical here, uh, signifying all powerful organisational structures that I have called functionalist imperatives, which simply means the imperative of a smoothly functioning city is to continuously enhance productivity and the health and safety of its citizens. So these functionalist imperatives signified by these sounds affect human behaviour in an everyday context. So this is the, these are the ideas I'm building. 
So the A signifying rupture is the absence of signification. It's a bit like someone who claims to be asexual. They don't um, um, identify as either um, male or female or of being interested in sex, for example. It's this no. So an A signifying rupture to me means that there are no significations in that particular sound field at the time. So I asked myself, how might I use a sound installation to remove the signification of urban sounds that I claim exist here. Now these ideas are built on uh, assumptions that urban sounds affect everyday behaviours, so I'm building on the ideas of people like Barry Truax and Michael Bull, the idea of the withdrawn listener. Uh, particularly Michael Bull uh, writes um, an amazing study talking about the use of headphones as a means to withdraw from the everyday sounds and creating your own internal personalised soundscape and so forth. And then there's uh, Lefebvre's uh, ISO rhythms, ISO being equal and the rhythm being daily repetition. So the idea that the sound that we experience day to day uh, repeats itself without change. And what are the type of the, the mundane uh, effects on the body of that experience? So thus a, sound, thus a sound installation is able to rupture a small space by changing our typical listening and bodily relationship with the sound environment. So last, uh, last theory slide. <laughs> Typically, uh, this is achieved through the use of field recordings. This is my approach, uh, which captures site-specific sounds that have been redesigned in the studio. So for me, the idea of creating a sonic rupture is not to bring in uh, an additional suite of sounds that fulfil uh, my vision as an artist, getting back to that tripolar arrangement earlier, but to think specifically about what is the existing environment, what are these social um, relationship with that environment and how can I use that environment back in on itself to create these new effects. So my, my first step is to actually go into a site that I'm interested in and, and record it and that becomes my base material. So within the rupture zone, which is essentially where the sound installation is, new non-determined experience can emerge as the typical experience signified by the daily presence of repetitive sound is temporarily subverted. So if we have a laneway, which you'll see in a minute, which has the same air conditioning sounds playing in the same place every day, the, the installation creates a rupture by creating the potential for new experience. So this, this is simply its idea. So the, sa the sound installation must be sympathetic to the surrounding sounds, otherwise it cannot rupture, only add new signifiers as intended by the artist. Okay, that's it, no more. <laughs> But I did have practice and theory in the title, so I thought I need to be true uh, to what I said I would do. So the book itself in chapter four uh, breaks it down into uh, five uh, approaches. So just to uh, confuse things, I've got four approaches in the paper, uh, but these five approaches actually come out of my own practice. So in chapter three, I talk about five installations and then I suggest uh, how they could be treated as an approach to soundscape design. And in chapter four, I then uh, talk about a whole bunch of other installation artists who, who could fit into those categories. So I'm gonna go into those now. So my first um, installation, if you like, was called Shutdown. This is an exhaust outlet that no longer exists. Uh, at RMIT uh, in Bowen Lane. It's been removed, uh, but it did exist for a very long time. And essentially there's a car park underneath and this would remove the exhaust fumes of that car park into, into the environment, making a very loud drone. And then just for, uh, e just for extra effect, they put a large metal awning over the top, <laughs> <laughs> which, which amplified uh, the, just the uh, right frequencies that will, that will annoy us. So, so uh, I... I uh, was teaching a sound studies class and we focused on that stack for the whole semester. So the first thing we did is we got it shut down. It took me about three months to get it shut down for half an hour and then it came back on and never got switched off again. Uh, but essentially this is the sonogram of the shutdown. You can see clearly halfway through uh, there's a change in, in, uh, in colour. It lightens up and that's where the, the, uh, the sound source is removed. And this very much fits in with the acoustic ecology precept of lo-fi, hi-fi. Um, and while I'm critical of that, that's actually a pretty good example of what they're talking about. And you say lo-fi on the left, hi-fi on the right. 
and in fact Truax talks about um, noise is a bit like a fog. Uh, noise does to the ear what fogs does to the eyes. So um, you, you can't see as well, you can't hear as well. And, and, and right on cue, a whole bunch of people start talking as it gets turned off. Mm -hmm. So they're all the voice formats. So that wasn't, uh, wasn't pre-designed, but it is, is quite a handy coincidence. So anyway, I'll play that. This one's quite loud. So. Nothing. Try again. Yeah. So I can hear very clearly. It, uh, it came in a bit late, but you can hear where the, the exhaust fan switches off, and it's almost like the space opens right out. So, so this approach we call uh, subtraction. However, uh, spending a lot of time in Melbourne's laneways, I, I've, I've visited probably all of them uh, during my PhD, and looking for this elusive site of respite where we could get uh, quiet, um, as the committed acoustic ecologist as I was at the time. And it dawned on me that there is just nowhere where there is an absence of noise. So as a sound artist and, uh, and soundscape designer, I am going to need to um, find a, an affirmative way to interact with noise. I can't just be critical and negative about it and say we've got to get rid of it. I've actually got to respond to it affirmatively to find new ways. So this is where I start moving away from this idea of requiring silence to thinking more about the imaginative, because if I can't get rid of noise, well, what can I do with it? Well, I can inter interact with it in creative ways. So this is a work for uh, the City of Melbourne. I've called this the addition approach. So I installed those four air conditioners. They weren't there previously. And inside each of the air conditioners, actually before that, I'll just, I've got a quick file to play here. So air conditioners playing augmented air conditioning sounds. Um, if I can't get rid of the things, maybe I can make them sound more interesting or diverse. That's the idea there. Um, the process uh, to get there was uh, spending a huge amount of time in this laneway full of air conditioners and notating them. I, I got to know them very well. This is <laughs> probably this is where I thought I'd made a really bad career. Uh, move in my life, but uh, but it seems to have worked out all right to date. Uh, but I so I, I labelled these air conditioners, got to know their different sounds and rhythms, and uh, but the city of Melbourne actually didn't like this site. They thought it was too undesirable, and thus we located this site. Sorry for the low res images here. It's all for it was for documentation at the time, but essentially it pop riveted several surfaces together with maximum uh, sound emission possibility with the vents. Friend welded up these stuck them to the wall, run the speaker wire through conduits, and there was a computer system uh, running spatialization software designed by Jeffrey Hannum uh, in the adjoining room. And that's what it looked like <laughs> at the end. So the idea was to catch um, tran transitionary states of people moving through, and I have a, a ton of wonderful stories. And to me, in some ways, this is probably the best example where a, a, a rupture occurred, and as I define it. Uh, and I think this, this uh, sonic graffiti page uh, uh, sums it up the best. The City of Melbourne have a policy of removing graffiti, as we all know, and that policy results in that nice shade of grey behind all that graffiti. So it, 
it was interesting because it all got painted grey before the installation started. And during the installation, this is all the graffiti that started appearing. Um, I have a lot of respect for graffiti artists and what they do in terms of their, their technical capacity. I'm not, I'm not saying the illegality, the illegality of it's okay, but their technical capacity is impressive. So on the left here, I kept thinking of Kandinsky's frozen music paintings or his visualisation of music. In the middle, couldn't think of a better example of um, representation of four equidistant sound sources. Next to that, we have a head with the ear pointing out, not the eyes. And then we have almost a spatialization figure. If I ask one of my students to trace out what a spatialization looked like, <coughs> it would probably look like that. So it was amazing to watch all this pop up during the installation. And I, I did actually run into an, uh, a graffiti artist down there and he said, it, it's true, we are painting to the work. So that was, that was amazing. And then uh, the City of Melbourne painted it all again at the end of the installation. I don't know if that was by design or not, but and then all of this popped up and it's, it strikes me how visual it is. People looking outwards, note the skull is in exactly the same place as the head, um, but there's now a, a cone of vision. So uh, for me, this is an example of how an environment can be affected by uh, a sound installation without the sound installation necessarily having an intention. So this quality of being a signifying, a lack of signification, therefore has some impact on the experiential uh, output of the artists in that space. So I claim. I'm highly contestable, of course. Sure. Yeah. One question. So just to clarify, so you said that you were interested in a signification. Mm. So how does making an air conditioning sound place with this one? Isn't it just reinforcing existing signification? Yeah. Well, the, the air conditioners I put in aren't actually air conditioners. That's the first thing to say. And the sounds that they're playing aren't air conditioning sounds. They're highly augmented uh, sounds that have been designed in the studio. And they've been designed in such a way, they only sit about one to two dB above existing environmental levels. So the idea is that, that they will uh, intertwine or interweave with the existing air conditioning sounds. Now. In some ways, this didn't fully um, achieve that because I had to move sites. Thus, I've called it an addition because in the end, I did, I did add sounds in that um, situation. Uh, but my reasoning there is it becomes A-signifying because if we can argue that the existing air conditioning sounds signify something, mm. then the creative intention is by mixing these design field recordings and changing those sounds Therefore, I change those significations. Whether or not that's ac actually achieved, but that, that's, that's the, uh, the purpose. So I'm going to fly through this one. Uh, I, I took this idea and turned it into uh, transformation or noise transformation. And this is essentially the soundscape design idea that I'm, I'm pushing uh, in my VC postdoc, which I'll get onto. This is a space underneath Federation Square called uh, the trench and on the other side of the trench is platform 13 which is the Sandringham line and it's filled with these sort of very loud train noises and PA sounds etc etc so I spent uh, three months down there for liquid architecture on behest <coughs> of um, Phillips and Marsis and uh, made the space blue and again applied this idea of field recording so recording those sounds I was hearing in that space transforming those sounds and then playing them back uh, in a live environment, which ended up being a series of performances over the weekend, because all my f field recordings were taken during the week, and then I found out there are no trains on the weekend. So in actual <laughs> fact, I had, to compl I had to design a performance in, in, a, in a couple of days. So uh, it went OK. Um, I do have a sound file to play there, but in, in the interest of time, given that I've probably got 10 minutes left, I'm going to leave that one. Uh, it, it is on the website, though. And this is another work, uh, so elicitation or passion. So the idea is uh, to try and uh, build community or uh, bring out uh, feelings of passion in those who, who encounter the event. It's more of a, a loose placeholder for, tho for those installations that can't be easily placed into the others, I must say. In this case, working with uh, Fiona Hillary, who's a neon artist, and uh, Elliot Palmer, who uses transducers to vibrate uh, containers, so we had all these um, containers vibrating and uh, creating uh, hums and drones through the space and then I had a series of speakers on top playing field recordings. But I'm going to fly through those ones because I want to talk at a bit more length about these, these two. 
So when I got the um, Vice Chancellor's Postdoctoral Fellowship and I'd written the book, I put in for a, a transurban innovation grant. And as you can see to this date, I hadn't really been thinking about working with industry uh, or taking these ideas beyond the experimental realm. But in this case, um, I was able to, oh, hang on, sorry, escape. So we approached Transurban about uh, the possibility of transforming the sound experience in parklands, the side uh, noise walls. So the idea here is you've got the traffic on the motorways and it's pouring this constant drone into these parklands and people's backyards. And we wanted to explore this idea. Well, is it possible to take this noise transformation idea that had been developed in the experimental process and apply it, apply it to a real world scenario? So what we did in this case is we placed live microphones in the environment. Um, this, this is developed by, noise, uh, by um, Transurban's media department, so it's all very neat and tidy which it wasn't in reality, of course. Uh, but the microphones are here, the speakers are here, and you create this zone of transformed noise. So it was a fairly uh, radical proposal and was surprised and happy that Transurban were willing to experiment with it. We're also working with engineers who claim to have active noise cancellation technology, which does not work with moving point sources, we very quickly found out. In which case, Transurban were quite interested in what we were trying to achieve. So. So essentially what we did is uh, we set up two tents. One was in Cremorne and another one was in uh, Sydney, in Epping on the right. And the, the space in Cremorne is surrounded by houses and apartments and the space in Epping um, was actually a retainer basin for all the water flowing down the motorway. And you couldn't get in uh, we were given access, but it, there's no public access. And this is Stefan Moore, who's a, uh, a sound designer from Northwest University, who I met at a conference, and he came along to help us out. Essentially, you've got these four, this is how it ended up, four speakers surrounding a listening position, two microphones that are well away from the, the speakers to account for feedback, and then we captured the live sound. They passed through algorithms. We had up to eight algorithms. And then we brought in uh, community members. We work with Sarah Pink and some uh, Shanti Sumateo and some other ethnographers. And we brought the local community in, sat them in this zone and said, what do you think? Does it work? And uh, to our surprise, in general, uh, people uh, really enjoyed the experience. Now, we could say that that's because they were just experiencing it this one time. And if it was there for months, it may be equally as annoying. We don't know. but. There, there were comments like, these sounds make us feel more, feel more relaxed or less anxious. It makes me want to sit on my balcony. As long as I can't hear it inside, I like it. There was a school on the other side of this zone that says, uh, if I, I would actually open my window if I could hear these sounds. So there was a lot of positive affirmation coming back. Now for me, uh, getting back to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the rupture concept, this still fulfills the idea of a sonic rupture because we're taking that, uh, that um, pre-existing sound and using that as the material to produce new sound but I think uh, is closer to achieving what the concept claims it can do because it's using microphones in a live environment which brings a huge amount of challenges in and of itself. So that's the, uh, the industry ground. At the same time I was working on this uh, beast with a group of um, with uh, a group of uh, designers a at uh, RMIT. So this is called Touchstone. Just thinking about it in, in retrospect, it was interesting to work on this and Transurban at the same time because Transurban was very much uh, a soundscape design application. And this is very much an artistic experimentation that attempted to bring in the community. So in this case, Chuanku, who's uh, an, an amazing interactive systems designer, uh, works with uh, capacitance, so the iPhone technology. And uh, these four aluminium strips are inlaid into this basalt stone, 
which we had carved and shaped uh, by Pyrenees quarries with the help of Charles Anderson. And as you uh, move your hands up to these metal strips, it causes these two metal plates to vibrate and play compositions. And also underneath the wooden panels, there are two speakers that play back uh, what we're calling ethnographic sounds that were recorded in this suburb of Clyde North. So I put out a, a, a call on the uh, local uh, Facebook page and I said, what are your favourite sounds of this suburb? And we got back all these um, um, answers, some of them very droll and, and, and cynical, but lots of very positive, affirmative things. And we went out and recorded those sounds. What this thing does, uh, as you play with it during the day, the ground vibrates and hums. Uh, and then each dawn and each dusk, it will play a small uh, composition based on how much with during the day. So certainly fits into the interactive uh, category of sound installations. And, um, and also this idea of not just sonically but materially working with site-specific conditions. So taking the typical materials of the, of the suburb, space, um, stone, metal, wood, and collapsing this all and subverting or diverting or changing its structure both as form and sound. So in that sense, it fits this idea of the rupture again. I'll stop harping on about that in a moment. Uh, there is an article online about that, but you don't need to see that right now. So this is a series of experimentations. There's your transducer down here, uh, called a buck kicker, because it was, it was um, developed for gamers. And, uh, and then we were just playing with, with these ideas of sympathetic resonances between um, speaker playback and vibrations, so getting the uh, sympathetic response in the body and the ear. And we then built a prototype where we were able to play with members of council and members of the team. And then we had a launch uh, with the local community who, who were pretty excited by it. And this is essentially what it sounds like. And that's probably a good point to end on because um, I'm imagining there's a uh, question time. Where are you? Yeah, that's... Oh, OK, here it is. So this is at dawn. So that's the new community hub council built and uh, we were brought in at the beginning of the building process to incorporate this artwork into the plaza. Okay, so, that, so that, that dawn sequence is actually uh, fixed. It's actually the uh, dust sequence that uh, chooses two different ethnographies and creates a composition based on what occurred during the day. And that uh, is, is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for taking it all in. <laughs>
natural uh, yeah. environment and the way that the kind of conditions are so we've got the bomb but okay. it's so much yep. all of us not being allowed to move. Thanks very much. <laughs> okay. Nice to meet you, John. Sorry. <laughs> Mm. I think I'm, I'm particularly interested in why you see it autistic as separate to environmental and social. Well, the point I, I don't see it as separate. I see them as all interconnected. So the idea of the, I mean, it's representation is flawed, particularly simple representation like this. But for me, uh, I see the artistic, uh, the environmental and the social have to be uh, uh, considered inseparable. Uh, for the uh, application of a successful installation. That's what I'm arguing with this, this image. So, when you, so you gave an example um, when you gave the talk, and I don't remember that name, uh, you gave an example. Yeah. But I think you said something like you see that as dealing with the environmental and the social, but not dealing with the artistic. Um, in one of the works I presented? Oh, when I was, well, I was just, I was, I was sort of um, discussing Peter Cusack as an example of someone who's done a huge amount of interesting work with the Positive Soundscape Project and also um, he's now talking about sonic places. He's very interested in uh, sound environments and how individuals and social bodies um, interact with those environments or feel about, uh, feel about those environments. So, for example, he's got this website called Favourite Sounds of Life, where people can upload the different sounds that they enjoy in the, in, in the environments they encounter. All I was saying in that situation, it was just an example, there could be many examples, uh, but what I guess what makes this different for that is by adding the, uh, the artistic pole, what we're actually looking at here is how can the art artist uh, intervene uh, in an environment in a meaningful way that considers the conditions of that environment and considers the uh, social interactions with that environment. So there's no, there's no sense of them being separated. Yeah. You, look, you look unconvinced. <laughs> Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm not saying it's not the, the, that work isn't artistic. I'm just saying you got to remember this. This came out of um, uh, you know Peter Cusack, do you? You worked no, with him. I know yeah. Work, yeah. yeah. So so this came out of um, the interviews I had with the artists mm -hmm. and thinking about uh, the things they had to say and the conversations that they had with me. Uh, that's 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 how this emerged. So w w I don't think that. Peter Cusack, to my knowledge, doesn't do artistic um, interventions insofar as create sound installations in public spaces. I could be wrong about that, but he's certainly an artist and his work is art. I, I'm certainly not saying that. But um, say Sam Oinger and Bruce Odlum, for example, um, their, their practice is very much about um, intervening in the environment with installations. So perhaps artistic isn't the right term. I could have used a different term there. But um, such as artistic infrastructure, for example. But that's what it's meant to represent in that case. But but thanks for bringing that out because um, I wouldn't want to give that missing misrepresentation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then like, it feels like the middle of the triangle refers to my mind to like sound and light. I would have to go back to the paper, <laughs> 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 and and uh, it, the paper's online, so each each attribute is. Um, is um, articulated and it, it's, all, it's, it's like an ethnographic study really because I've taken these interviews of each of these creators so it's not, this is not so much about my work but more uh, the impression and information I got from reading their work, yeah. But I'm sorry I don't actually <laughs> entirely remember what that one is, which is, yeah. But it sits right in the middle of the three so it must, must be important. Well, that uh, comes to an end in June, and um, and I'm presently looking at a uh, 
uh, artwork with the City of Melbourne uh, in the new Civic Square. And I note also that um, Monash Arts has, uh, has got an uh, application in there too. So. Uh, sorry, the new University Precinct, not Civic Square, University Precinct off Grattan Street near the City of Melbourne. And there's a, there's a big... Um, uh, a big grant to do a, an interactive artwork that's uh, considering the uh, the history and heritage of the site. So, yeah, yeah, could be <laughs> awesome for whoever gets it. Yeah, yeah and uh, and that's going to keep me busy. Let's put and, and decor application as well. It's nearly ruined me, I think. So. <laughs> This one? So, like, where's the infrastructure? So where are the speakers and so forth? No, no, no. I mean, like, the, there was a recording of someone singing, like, yeah. out of the information. Was like, yeah. 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 Yeah
they, so the research question was, uh, would uh, this noise transformation approach be desirable to residents along noise walls? Easy. Uh, this one was a bit more complicated um, <laughs> because, <laughs> as you say, it's highly conceptual and experimental and, 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 and so forth. But Yes, oh, I'm in the design yeah. department, yeah. So, so I was a sound artist on this project, but we also had an interactive systems designer oh, right. and a landscape architect mm. and an interior designer. Oh, right. So I guess in one way, one of the research questions is how can those four disciplines work together to achieve yeah. something? Um, but how do we install this type of, uh, if you like, delicate um, interactive systems in harsh outdoor mm. environments? And, uh, and Chuan's done it. You know, it's amazing what he's achieved there. So if you, if you, if you put, yeah, yeah, um, Chuan, where are you? Um, essentially, at this end, so if you, if you pull out these wooden panels at this end, um, you've got a, a junction box that's connected to a room inside the community centre. And in the community centre, there's the amp driving the, the speakers and the transducers and also the lighting. And he's got an Ethernet cable connected between that and a small um, artefact that has wires connected to these four aluminium strips and that's what sends the interactive data through and then controls the computer, the information on the computer. So, um, I mean, it, it was interesting because we were working with the builders putting this in with our hard hats and, and you know, I mean, Ray was great but a lot of them were really just about putting a PowerPoint under the ground, like they did not like it at all. Uh, but it's there and it works. So in that sense, I think that's the research question, the first phase. Can it be done? Yes, it can be done. Now the second phase is, is, is it going to make any difference to the community? Or are they just going to go, oh yeah, another artwork. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so there's a, <laughs> and, and because, because, well, well, well. This this image is a, this image is a winner. I'd, I'd like to say I just I just happen, I happened to be there on a Sunday and all these people were there, uh, but I, but of course that's not the case. That was that was the opening day. Um, but look, there are there are people coming along. What was great about this community day is that we is that, that these people know about it and they live in the suburb. So on the other side of the community centre, there. A, 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 an old folks home, it's a retirement home, apologies, uh, retirement home and you can see some of the people possibly there and the person working in the community centre tells me that every now and again a group of old people come over and all put their hands on the rock and feel the vibrations, <laughs> so that's cool and, uh, and, and you get some teenagers coming over and playing with it, so people are engaging with it but at this stage it's still too abstract, like council wanted to put a plaque saying what to do and we're like, no, no. And then they wanted to put handprints on the rock and we're like, no, don't do that. So there is this sort of interesting question about, well, we want to we want to try and preserve, preserve it. Um, it. It's kind of an experimental or a, a type of encounter. But in actual fact, the council's saying, well, well, we want people to know what it is. So, so that's sort of a research question, it's an aesthetic research question, but a research question anyway, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, they, they got that here too. Oh, really? Yeah. But mm. I don't know that I've ever seen any formal evaluation of whether anyone actually likes it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I, I think I like it, but no one's ever asked me if I like it. Especially when you have it. interactive mm. elements in it as well. How, how, do you how much more? <laughs> <laughs> but I probably wouldn't 
But imagine, but imagine that moment of discovery when you land on it and the ground started vibrating. Yeah. And, and in a way, we want that. We, we want that sort of sense of encounter or surprise. But the problem is if you go too far in that direction, like you say, nobody knows it's there. And, and Chuan and I would have these great conversations because Chuan's a, 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 you know, he's, he's right on it. There's got to be an instant response. You know, there's got to be an instant response. So people know says, no, 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 make them, they have to hold it for ages before this. So having these sort of conversations, trying to find it halfway between, but I think Tuan in some ways is, is right. You do need some type of instant response, otherwise people just lose attention. Yeah, quickly. Well, we wouldn't so. want to install it in the great brain. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> hey, rising people's uh, anxiety levels. Uh, they'd want to be the opposite. Yeah. Um, so, actually, and inter this conversation is interesting from what you said because you said there's all these research questions that kind of grow out of it too. Um, but it's on the way to Phillip Island if you want to check it out. If you ever go to Phillip Island, it's in Clyde North, which is on the edge of Melbourne, which is essentially. <laughs> Phillip Island. <laughs> no, oh, that'd be good. I'd be well up for that. But no, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty. It's not going anywhere. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. And when when they drop the rocks in, the the council made us glue it down as well. These two ton rocks. It's not going to. It's not going to go anywhere. Yeah. So they got glue under them. A uh, very strong glue. <laughs> <laughs> glue that sticks basalt and cement together, apparently. So. Oh well. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the questions. <laughs>